Yes, I can see your screen. You can start. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Salius and uh, Dominique, for inviting me for for this presentation. Uh, I would like to introduce the the webinar with uh, an update on what we are uh, doing at the JRC and in the Commission to implement uh, the Inspire Reference Validator. We have uh, a long-running action that basically has started uh, right at the beginning of the process for Inspire maintenance and implementation uh, on validation and conformity testing. Um, and you, you may ask yourself, why do we need a common validator at, at the European level? And we have a number of reasons for that. Um, the first one, and I think it's the most important one, is to help uh, implementers uh, to check their implementation progress. And I'm, I'm happy to see that there's a, a number, a lot of people on the webinar today that are actually, I think, implementing in, in the member states Inspire. So I think uh, you are, are really the target, the main target audience um, for this validation tool. Um, on the second hand, on the other hand, we also would like to help uh, national coordinators and the uh, colleagues uh, at, in the Commission to monitor the progress of, of implementations in the member states and across Europe. So that's another way to check. And the third one is uh, also quite quite important is to see for uh, providers of software solutions uh, to see if their solutions actually how they are performing against the Inspire requirements. So these are the, let's say there's the three main target audience, but I, I would stress that basically the, the main reason is really to help implementers to check uh, how they're doing. And um, when we started this whole activity, we, we, there was basically a recognition that, that we already have a number of validation services in the JRC, and I, I'll, I'll come to talk to you about uh, that in, in, at the end of the presentation, but also in some member states and in some uh, research projects. So we could we see that uh, there were a number of tools that were doing more or less the same, but sometimes they didn't really produce the same results or they, they kind of... Uh, gave slightly different results. Um, so, so we wanted to basically make sure that we have really one reference that is agreed uh, among member states uh, across Europe, but also to, to try and get uh, synergies um, uh, between these different tools and not basically do parallel uh, developments uh, of more or less the same thing. So basically, uh, we started this activity uh, under the um, auspices of the uh, Maintenance and Implementation Group, the MIG, um, to try and define uh, the commonly agreed uh, rules. But we, we quickly saw that basically we are also uh, need a tool, basically, that, that can be used. Um, so we started uh, to some two years ago to, to develop this tool, which we, we now call the Inspire Reference Validator, under these or by support um, from the uh, ISA and ISA squared program uh, under the actions Arena and Elise. Um, and the development of, of the tool basically uh, is uh, to uh, provide uh, executable tests uh, for all the Inspire technical uh, guidance documents. And we have a first uh, version. Yeah, can can you please everybody mute their phone? We can hear some heavy breathing somewhere in the background. Thank you. Um, the uh, the first version was published uh, uh, in the summer last year, um, where we covered the tests for the Annex One data specifications, uh, for metadata, uh, the technical guidance version 1.3, and for uh, download services based on on the Atom or WFS specifications. And we're currently now working on the uh, the, the next uh, releases, um, uh, adding additional executable tests for metadata, the new uh, version of the technical guidelines. Uh, that work uh, has um, been almost completed. We are currently in the testing phase, so that should be coming live uh, relatively soon. Uh, for view services, for web map services and web map uh, tile services, and then for the Annex 2 and 3 data specifications, discovery services, and uh, the other download service uh, specifications based on SOS and uh, WCS. Overall, the aims for this development were to build a, a reusable tool that was quite important, uh, that is open source, uh, and that can provide this reference tool uh, at the European level. We also wanted to build upon the existing solution rather than building something from scratch in order to, to use the synergies that I mentioned at the beginning. And also we want to be able to, uh, to make the tool configurable and, and make it um, extensible so that you can add your own test rules um, as well. 
So the starting point for this whole development was the repository uh, for abstract test suites. So in under the umbrella of the MIG, as I said, we developed um, abstract test suites for all the Inspire technical guidelines. And these are basically managed in a repository uh, in GitHub. You can see the link below. And they are basically all follow the same structure that provides uh, basically a, a description of what is being tested and uh, as much as possible an abstract description on how to execute the test. So the starting point for this is always a requirement in the technical guidelines uh, and where uh, applicable also a reference to the relevant, the corresponding requirement in the legal text. And then there's a, there's a clear description on uh, what should be the steps to be executed to really check whether this requirement uh, is met. While doing this work, uh, it's quite interesting. We 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 have discovered and we keep discovering that uh, a lot of a number of the requirements in the technical guidelines are difficult to test because in the way that they are uh, being formulated. So in, in some cases, we actually have provided some uh, some suggestions for clarifying the requirements or, or or even updating the requirements in the technical guidelines in order to to make them more clear and more um, easily testable um, the, the second repository uh, that's important is the executable uh, test suite repository and that is basically the implementation of the abstract test suites uh, again it's managed on github um, and that is basically um, where all the, the executable tests are being stored. Uh, we also have a, a detailed guidance document that basically describes uh, for developers on how to develop their own tests. So if you want to extend uh, the current repository with national tests or with uh, domain specific tests, uh, there is some, some detailed guidance on how, how that can be done. Uh, for those of you who have not used the tool yet, um, here's a, a, a sample test report. Uh, so you can see it is structured in a number of conformance classes. So within most of the technical guidelines, there is uh, there are several conformance classes addressing different aspects of the specification. Uh, and for each of those, you will have a block, let's say, in the in the test report. Um, the color coding is basically green. If uh, everything's uh, every test inside the conformance class is passed, uh, is red if there are some errors. And in this case, you'll see uh, there's only one error, but still it's, it's marked as red. And then uh, in the yellow case, there may be uh, some manual tests to be executed. Um, we, we've had uh, a lot of comments already on the color coding, and uh, this is one of the things that we, we're thinking about for the, for, the, for the development to make that uh, maybe a bit um, more intuitive or more uh, friendly. And that, that uh, not everything looks red just because you fail maybe one of the six or how many tests you have in one conformance class. When you dig down further into the uh, the test report, you will then get very detailed uh, reports on basically uh, what has been tested. So there is uh, usually a reference to the description in the abstract test suite, um, and you will get some detailed error reports from the from the executable test suite to really show uh, in which line and which feature uh, there has been an error. In this case, for the for the data testing. So this basically uh, shows again that our main target audience are really implementers. So this is a very technical view that will allow uh, an implementer to really uh, dig down into the issue and uh, fix the, the problems that they, ha they have with their, with their data. Uh, now the whole uh, uh, tool is, is based uh, on the Inspire test framework or ETF as well. Um, that is basically the software that is used to run the executable test suites. Um, it is based on the uh, ETF uh, software uh, that uh, was developed uh, in a number of uh, projects um, earlier uh, and that further extends uh, the software. It's an open source testing framework for, for SDIs. The main uh, design goals for the ETF are basically to make it uh, user friendly, to make it consistent with the uh, specification model of OGC and ISO. Basically that is the structure of uh, specifications into conformance classes and individual requirements and, and tests, and to make it possible to uh, test all kinds of resources in SDI, so not only metadata, but also special data sets and, and services. Uh, we have a, a relatively uh, modular architecture um, uh, that makes it possible to extend the framework further with a number of test drivers. Uh, currently, we have uh, test drivers 
uh, for uh, SOAP UI to uh, allow uh, the testing of web services. Base X that is for any kind of XML data. And then also we have a connector for the team engine of OGC in order to basically connect to tests um, of the OGC uh, site testing um, framework. Uh, and then basically you can load into this uh, framework uh, a number of executable uh, and abstract test suites um, that are basically uh, then um, being executed using these different test drivers. And that basically means that you can easily extend uh, the, the whole framework with your own uh, executable test suites uh, depending on your requirements. Uh, we have a web interface for the controlling the, the test runs and managing the test reports and, and the test objects. Um, but there is uh, also uh, an API that I will show to you in a minute um, in order to access the, uh, the framework directly um, for machine-to-machine -machine, uh, interaction. For the test reports, they are basically uh, structured in the same way. Uh, you will be able to access them in HTML in the user interface, but also in, in XML um, if you access it programmatically. There's two types of deployment uh, for the uh, framework. Uh, there can be a central instance, as we have uh, established it in the JRC, um, and you see the, the URI below, where basically any user can basically send their test uh, objects, uh, so that could be services, could be data, metadata, um, to uh, this uh, central instance and basically receive uh, the test reports um, uh, uh, from, from the testing. Now, uh, in a number of cases, you may have either uh, very large data sets in your organizations or you maybe have services uh, and, and resources that are access protected and you don't want to, to share them or upload them in a central instance outside of your organization. And for these cases, we have basically foreseen that uh, also it is possible to use the software um, inside your own organization. So you, you would basically deploy the tool inside your own organization um, and would run uh, it inside uh, your own uh, this firewalls within the, the boundaries of your own organization. And you wouldn't need to share uh, large data sets or protected data sets uh, outside of your uh, organization boundaries. Uh, it also allows you to add additional executable test suites um, to configure the, the test framework in the way that you would like to, to use it. I already mentioned that there is uh, also uh, an API uh, that is documented using the Open API uh, standard. Uh, so that basically allows you to do all the, the basic uh, functionalities from starting test runs, from uh, retrieving test uh, results, um, and, and really digging down into the, the different details. Other features of the ETF uh, software is, uh, as I already mentioned, there is the test driver for the OGC team engine. Uh, we can select a number of uh, multiple um, conformance classes as long as they are compatible. Of course, you cannot combine metadata and service tests, for example, but you can only combine different metadata tests, for example. Uh, that is quite interesting at the moment where we are looking at the new technical guidelines. Uh, so uh, while we're doing the, the testing of the new implementation, we are actually testing one metadata record against both the old and the new technical guidelines tests. And, and this way you can say, see basically uh, what uh, has changed between the two technical guidelines. So that's a quite a, a nice feature in this case. Um, you can also select uh, multiple XML files for a single uh, test run, for example, for metadata and data tests. Uh, and there is built-in support for multilinguality, even though at the moment the user interface and the reports are in English, but uh, the software support it basically is, is prepared for uh, allowing additional translation for, for both uh, the reports and user interfaces. And last but not least, uh, there is uh, good documentation both for users, developers, and administrators for, for the software. Um, one clarification that we, we often uh, are asked about is uh, what's the, in the relationship between the, this Inspire Reference Validator and the, the testing tool that exists inside the GeoPortal harvesting component. Uh, we have both these uh, tools that are available. Um, they are both uh, made available also through APIs, um, but uh, it's, it's important to understand that both of these tools have evolved uh, quite sever separately and provide quite different functionality and, and also aim to serve different purposes. 
So for the ETF uh, reference validator, as I said before, this is the one and only agreed reference implementation of all the validation rules. The validation rules have been developed under and agreed uh, under the umbrella of the maintenance and implementation uh, group, so under the let's say umbrella of the member state official member state representatives. So that is uh, the let's say the authoritative uh, source for, for validation results. Uh, on the other hand, we have built the, the testing tool for the geoportal um, for the geoportal during the harvesting. Uh, the main aim here is uh, is different. It's is really to extract and enrich the information that we find in the metadata. So we want to be able to present them in a useful and usable fashion in the, in the geoportal. So we're really trying to check, of course, uh, that everything is complete and correct, and that we are able to establish links between, for example, the network services and the data sets that they um, that they serve. Um, also, this uh, tool has evolved uh, prior and in some degree in parallel to the uh, development of the reference validator. And in some cases, it may not be fully in, in line uh, and be consistent with the agreed uh, um, abstract test suite. So it, it should really not be considered as a complete and authoritative Inspire compliance test. Um, which tool to use? Uh, clearly, if you want uh, an authoritative answer, you should use uh, only the uh, the reference validator. Um, in case you discover that there are different res differ differing results between the two tools, please uh, let us know. Um, there are uh, um, there is the GeoPortal help desk and there is the GitHub repository that we use for for logging issues on the reference validator. If you track, if you see anything that is inconsistent between the two tools. Please let us know because, of course, the aim is that the two tools uh, should be providing the, the, the same results. Okay, uh, another interesting question and, and that uh, we have ongoing discussions is the, the governance of the ETF software. And here I'm really talking about the, the tool that is running the tests and not the tests themselves. We have uh, now set up a, a standalone GitHub organization that is uh, responsible for the ETF software. Um, before that, uh, the ETF was uh, residing inside a, an organization run by Interactive Instruments that were the, the initial developers. Um, and we've now set up uh, basically a steering group um, that is responsible for the governance uh, of the ETF software project. Um, that includes currently as uh, members the JRC and Interactive Instruments. Uh, we're striving to, to agree uh, by consensus on, on basically the future roadmap and the, the features to be developed. Um, but the, the steering group is basically open to other organizations and developers that provide very significant contributions. On the other hand, we have a, established a technical committee that basically uh, is uh, responsible for overlooking the technical um, soundness of the project, that is responsible for approving uh, change, change requests or uh, new developments um, on the software. Um, uh, again, it's open to any um, developer that has proven their technical capacity uh, over time. Um, and if, if there's proposals um, for new members, the, the steering group will decide about that. And then, of course, we have a number of, of developers, uh, hopefully an increasing number over the, the future, next future, uh, that will pro provide the, the project contributions. Now, it's important, uh, as I said, that this is really the governance for the, uh, for the software. Uh, we also have a governance for the, uh, the, the tests, the ATS and the ETS, and that is basically uh, under the governance of the MIG, as I, as I said uh, before. Um, and we have an established subgroup for validation and conformity testing, 2017.4, uh, that uh, meets uh, uh, online once a month. Um, uh, and that is basically reviewing uh, comments and issues uh, that are raised uh, on the current ATS and ETS. So a number of people have, have raised uh, problems that they see where the validator produces unexpected results. And we're basically going through these comments and try to assess whether uh, the behavior is correctly or whether maybe uh, there is a bug in the implementation or maybe there is something un clear in the abstract test suite or even in the technical guidelines requirements. Um, also, this group should be acting as a, a contact point for the validator in the member states and really promote uh, the tool in the member states um, and also advise us uh, in, the, in the commission for the further evolution and the long-term sustainability of the, of the 
test framework. So basically make suggestions for features for improvement of the tool um, uh, as well. Um, as I said, we have ongoing work now on the metadata version 2.0. Um, we've started the work on the view services uh, for WMS and WMTS. Uh, we thought we could start directly with implementing the executable test suites, but it, it proved that there were a number of issues with the abstract test suites that we had. So we, we've basically started in cleaning those up. And as soon as that part is completed, we will start with the implementation um, for, the, for the WMS and the WMTS. Uh, like for the WFS, these will be largely relying on uh, calls to the OGC site engines for, w for these two uh, specifications. Um, but there are also a number of Inspire specific requirements specifically around the, the capabilities um, and the extended capabilities of those services. Um, the, the other next step is to also start with the download services for SOS um, and uh, for the data we're then looking at the Annex 2 and 3 data specifications. Um, the discovery services and the WCS will probably then be the, the last things that we, we will uh, look at and this is basically based on some prioritization that we received from the, from the MIG. Um, we also are actively developing and, and further rolling out the ETF testing framework uh, under the governance structure that I just described. Um, and we will be discussing, uh, of course, outreach and promotion and how we can uh, sustain uh, long-term funding and, and sustainability for the, for the project. That's it from me. Uh, if you're interested to in getting uh, further involved, uh, please have a look at the ATS and ETS uh, and the software. If you have any issues with any of those, please submit uh, issues through the GitHub uh, issue trackers. Um, and as I said, if you're interested in developing your own tests, um, there will there are the developer manuals, but we're also planning uh, later towards the end of this year to organize uh, dedicated workshops uh, for developers. Um, uh, where we basically really do maybe probably two-day hands-on um, exercises to, to develop uh, your own tests. So if you're interested in that, you can also drop us a line and we'll keep you posted about uh, these activities. Uh, and again, uh, please use the tool. Uh, if, if it doesn't work as you expect or you get unexpected results, please please uh, let us know uh, so we can uh, fix uh, the, the errors. Or if you, the software has a number um, of, or you have new ideas for features or uh, proposals for changes um, in the user interface or in any kind of working of the software, uh, please make those suggestions on the ETF. Um, uh, issue tracker so we, we can try and factor it in into the development roadmap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> now we can uh, accept some uh, questions. Uh, so please, if anyone want to, anyone like to pose a question, please raise your hand or you can type a question in the, in the chat window. Uh, I receive a few questions and I can uh, read them. Um, the question was from uh, Thomas from uh, uh, Norway. Uh, he asked, uh, just wondering if there is a framework uh, time frame for support of the WMS and WMTS service validation. Um, yes, as I said, we, we need to initially uh, finalize the work on the ATS uh, and we will then start with the work on the ETS. Uh, I think after the summer uh, is, is a realistic time frame. I'm not sure I can promise uh, it to be ready by the Inspire conference, but that, that could be a good goal, I think. Okay, um, then uh, there's a long question, one question from um, uh, the from Natalie De Latter from Belgium. Is the planning for metadata and view service ready? I don't know what what is exactly mean planning uh, for metadata. I think uh, yeah. So I mean for the metadata version 2.0, as I said, we already have an implementation for the executable test suites. We're currently reviewing that, um, and uh, we still see a number of issues with the implementation. So it, it, it will be probably another month or so before that 3D goes live. Um, and for the view service, I just uh, said what the planning is. Okay, thank you. Then there is a long question with the hyperlinks uh, by uh, 
Manuel Frias um, and uh, that uh, um, poses on uh, three available validators. Uh, the one um, uh, on the Inspire Geo Portal dot Europe uh, editor. Uh, the next one on Validator 2, and the third one on the ETF web app. Uh, and uh, uh, the person asks actually uh, which one is uh, recommended to use out of those three. I, I have okay. put the links to you, Michael, in the chat window. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Uh, I I, um, I I think for the last two, I I think I answered that uh, in the in the three slides in the presentation. So if you want an authoritative result, please use the ETF, uh, the reference validator. The validator tool is really not uh, meant as an authoritative tool. It's basically a tool that helps us uh, in the geo portal to uh, enrich uh, resources. And if you see discrepancies between the two, please let us know about the uh, the discrepancies. Uh, the editor uh, is really a, a tool that, that helps uh, member states to, to create their own metadata. It is currently not actively maintained. Uh, so there is a number of uh, issues that um, that need to be added there. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what it uses <laughs> as the internal uh, uh, validation tool. So I, I would assume that it is linked to the validator tool of the GeoPortal because they're basically both GeoPortal components. But uh, maybe we should uh, put... Um, we're we're in the process of basically clarifying the the usage of that, and maybe we should we should make it more clear uh, to to put disclaimers on the relevant pages on on what they're basically used to be used for. Okay, thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat window, and I don't see any raised hand now. So I think we can uh, proceed further with the presentations and. Uh, if more questions questions will be raised up, then uh, then they will be answered after the whole presentations. So now, uh, thank you very much for Michael, and uh, we're moving to the presentation from Roy Mellum um, on the use of the Inspire validator by in European Location Services. So I I am passing the screen to Roy. Roy, we can see your screen. You can start. Now. Roy? <clears throat> Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you now. You can start. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Solius. So I will talk a little bit about uh, the use of the Inspire Validator in the European Location Services. Uh, I am currently the leader of the technical group in the European Location Services uh, Consortium. So uh, my presentation will not be very long, but I think it will uh, build well on, on uh, Michael's presentation. So I will start with uh, just giving a short recap of, uh, of what ELS actually is. It is uh, built uh, the <coughs> continuation of the European Location Framework Process Progress Project, and it um, what we are doing is that we are providing a set of tools and uh, of course a lot of inspired data through services from national mapping and cadastral agencies, uh, mainly uh, WMS and WFSs, of course metadata as well. Uh, we are chosen. 11 selected INSPIRE teams, which we believe are NMCA typical. And currently we are providing approximately 90 services from 14 countries. And most of them are web feature services actually. And currently providing approximately 120 feature types. Uh, as I said, we have uh, several tools in this platform. Uh, the last one we have included is actually the validator, as we call it. It's uh, I will come. This is what I will talk more about during this presentation. Uh, so, yeah, those of you not been familiar with uh, ELF or ELS before, please visit the location framework the EU website. Uh, this is a relatively simple sketch of the loop of the data supply process in ELS. Uh, 
Uh, it's basically a five-step procedure. I will not go into details with this, but these are the two steps where the validation comes in. We have actually made it mandatory for the providers who want services and data provided through the ELS platform to uh, provide us with the test report from the Inspire val validator for metadata and in particular for web feature services. This is of course to ensure that they are conformed to the specifications and that we can uh, include it in our uh, pan-European services as well. So we actually make it mandatory to for the data providers to, to use the validators. So regarding to what uh, validation we are asking for in European location services or call it conformance classes as you use quite a lot, uh, Michael. Uh, we need the validation reports for metadata services and also we are trying out the latest conformance classes also for, for uh, GML validation. This is at a very early stage for the time being, but uh, looks promising. So what, what I think now, and uh, as you also saw in Michael's presentation, is that we, we believe that this tool now provides a good functionality for these types of validation. Uh, we have used the previous version of the ETF tool, and that was that did not indeed have user-friendly reports, which we have now. And what I find very good is the, that uh, if you get an error, you will have it with a direct reference to the technical guidelines, which is a very nice feature from my, my point of view. Uh, we also find this, uh, <clears throat> that now, as Michael also mentioned, we now have a very extended number of conformance classes or executable text suites available. What I also would like to emphasize is that we find it very, very nice that uh, the Inspire Spy Validator also we has uh, the work has a very close cooperation with the OGC test suite developments. That is for us quite important as well. So uh, we have had the ELS validator tool available since April. So we are uh, providing this as a, a tool in the ELS platform. It is of course complementary to the Inspire original validator. Uh, I will come back to home and what, what we have done later. So why are we doing this? Uh, we need to allow validation of services with basic authentication. And as Michael also said, allow validation for large data sets in our own premises. But what we also want to do is actually to gain experience of the technology so that we can and evaluate it for use for national schemes. And perhaps also, if you intend to use it, then of course, uh, provide the test suites for, for those. And we also hope we can support the Inspire Validator development community by this work we are doing here. So how have we actually done the, uh, the work? Uh, we contracted interactive instruments actually who has quite good knowledge uh, of these tools. And of course it builds on the, the two uh, repositories uh, Mikhail mentioned, the executable test suite repository and the ETF repository. Uh, those are of course used uh, where we are in and stored in uh, uh, enterprise edition software repository in, in uh, at the interactive instruments. But we had to make some minor extension before to the deployment. We, we had to do some security enhancements in our Linux uh, environment. We had to do some deployment configuration extensions and we also uh, made an HTTP proxy available as a part of the, um, the deployment. And all this is now stored within this centralized 
repository here. And then it is very simple for us actually to use the Linux package manager to actually all the time update what we have on, on the server in our environment here. Um, I must say I was very glad we, we, we contracted interactive instruments for this because it might not be quite straightforward to install this in your own uh, environments. That's our experience. So here is actually um, the start page. We have done nothing with the uh, web interface and it's uh, yeah quite simple actually to, to use. Uh, here's the user dialog if you want to configure a test run for for a WFS service. It's also quite straightforward and uh, forward and you can also see uh, uh, add your credentials if you have an authentication uh, enabled. Uh, just one more screenshot with some example of of conformance classes or executable test suites, as you see here, you have, for example, for administrative units, a lot of conform five conformance classes, and so on. So this makes this a very comprehensive tool for us, I think, and uh, we believe we have great benefit of, of using this um, installation also in, in our premises. So uh, I think my final slide is this one. This is the URL. It's uh, open. The service is open and free, and it's uh, currently running on only one server. So it might be that if all of you <laughs> try to use it after this this uh, webinar, it might be some there might be some performance issues there. But uh, please feel free, free to use it in in the future if you like. So I think that concludes my presentation, uh, Solius. Okay. Thank you very much, Roy. <clears throat> Uh, now we'll move to the ANS uh, presentation and crab from uh, from Belgium. And uh, as I said, we you can pose questions to to Roy or to other presenters after all of the presentations. But uh, in the chat window, you can do even uh, now during the presentation. Um, and the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so I work at the KU Leuven, but actually we work for the National Geographic Institute of Belgium. Um, maybe a little bit about myself. I um, do mostly technical work, which is uh, programming, implementing, um, building tools. Um, so I am not an expert on the, for example, on the inspired specs. Of course, I know them, but I'm not a, really an expert. I am also not part of the um, of the data provider side. So um, me, I am more in between. Um, so um, for this presentation, it is um, about using the validator for metadata, data and um, services. Um, when it comes to the services, uh, we don't have a direct, um, um, we haven't used the, the, the validator for services yet, so I won't be talking about that. I will mostly be talking about data and also a little bit about the metadata. So let's start with the, um, with the data. Um, Um, I just want to mention that um, we have already started with transforming data of uh, teams in Annex 1 and Annex 3. Um, for now, uh, the, the metadata validator only offers full support for Annex 1 teams, but as uh, Michael Lutz has mentioned, uh, apparently uh, the Annex 2 and Annex 3 uh, validation is on its way. Um, up till now, we have done mostly actually, um, we have done work ourselves implementing schematrons, but I also have learned apparently that we can also use the 
validator to implement their own tests. So this is very interesting and we will check that uh, option out. Um, so from the point of view of the user of this validator, um, I found it very straightforward to find the validator, very straightforward to find our scope, which team we want to uh, validate. This part was, um, was quite easy. Um, but um, what I found a little bit lacking or what I found, let's say, let's say confusing is um, that I have read the data specifications and I have found uh, the list of abstract test uh, suite um, inside the specifications. And then when I see the, uh, the validator, I find I only can find four of these conformance classes again in the validator. Now, when I read the specs in detail, I know there are reasons for this. Eh? Some cannot be implemented or, or are dealing with the WMS instead of data and things like that. But maybe it would be useful from the user point of view to have some kind of um, yeah, some a little bit a uh, little bit of communication, a small text, a small info box about this, or maybe even an empty conformance class, just so that the user is aware that it is there, but maybe it's implemented uh, somewhere else. Or yeah, for me, I found this a little bit confusing. The same also with the ex with the tests inside, because when I read the abstract test suite. I found that in the conformance class, there is a list of tests. But if I read the conformance class information, I, that, I don't find this information directly. And there is probably a very good reason for this, but maybe it would be very useful, I think, to have some kind of information or communication about this. Um, then for um, running the test, uh, usually it works quite well, it all works by itself, but I have found that um, uploading data to the to the server doesn't always work, especially with uh, larger data sets. Um, but according to the info on the on the on the portal or on the website, the data set we are trying to run, for example, shouldn't be too big, but yet the upload fails. And the, um, the error message is not always very clear. So sometimes you have to go and try with trial and error, figure out what you can do better. Sometimes it's just running one test at the same time. Sometimes it just works if you try it the next day. So it maybe has to do something with the server being used too heavily. But because the error message is very general, you don't really know. It would be useful to say, to have a message saying, uh, maybe it's too busy, try again in an hour or, but okay. Um, um, we have, or I have figured out that if you have a WFS or a download service available as a workaround, then it works perfectly. But of course, um, you have to have this in place. Um, I guess it will also help if you install it locally, but then you will have to figure out how to do this. And this is not always easy. Um, then for the test report itself, it's for me, I find the colors very intuitive, very easy to understand. Um, maybe a small uh, remark here is that um, the abstract test suite is, is divided in two, let's say, big parts. You have the conformance with the implementation rules and the conformance with the technical guidance um, of which only one is really required and the other is, um, well, you better do it, but you don't really have to do it. And there is no mention of this inside the test results, which would also be nice to have this, this uh, nuanced difference. But for the rest, I found it very easy to go and read the tests and see what's wrong and then fix the, fix the problems. But um, as a side note, yes, it is very technical. You need to know something 
on GML on XML to be able to understand the best uh, results. Otherwise, it may be a bit too technical. Um, again, what I mentioned before, this this there is no clear one-on-one -on -one relation with the abstract test suite, which are in the technical guidance, and then. Um, the test report or the, the little blocks inside or the little titles inside, maybe it would be good to either change the titles to have them exactly match or maybe have some info or, on what is inside and what is not, where is the rest, why are some not there. And this is now an example where I found many more tests than there were in the abstract test suite. So, um, well, yeah, it's just basically the same issue. Uh, so for service, so that was the part for uh, testing of data sets, um, services we haven't done. Um, and then for metadata, <laughs> I actually have the same remark apparently everybody has, and that is that if I go to the Inspire portal, I find one, two, three Inspire validators. And also my question was, uh, what is the relation? Which one do I have to use? Of course, by now. We have uh, learned more about this, so that's very good. Um, but well, I made my slide, and I actually have a small example in where we uh, in Belgium actually have always used so um, this GeoPortal resource browser um, up till now because it was always there. And I have tested now a small data set, and I have found that the, the results are very different. So um, this resource, this GeoPortal, GeoPortal resource browser, sorry, and the metadata validator on the right side of the screen, they use the same engine I have figured out, but the Inspire validator, of course, is, is a different implementation. And um, if I run my data set or if I test my metadata, sorry, then I get different results. So for the, this is the data set, uh, or at least the metadata of this data set. So if I test it in the, the old, let's call it the old validator, um, then our data set passes, uh, sorry, our metadata passes. Um, of course, there are small potential warnings, but in overall, uh, it says 100% okay. Um, the, I found there are small differences in the interoperability test Testing, but it's not because the one does different tests from the other, but because um, apparently some are tested in one of the two old validators and in the other one they are not tested. So, but um, that, that's for the old validator. But then if we test our metadata in the uh, new validator that is presented today, then we found that we do get errors. So, um, yeah. So we figured out now, we learned now today that it's better to listen to this uh, new validator. But um, yeah, the errors we got are very different from the ones we are used to with the old validator. For example, I just gave these errors as an example here. Um, the, one of the first uh, problems we encounter is that apparently the, the validator cannot find this um, element GMD uh, or ND metadata, then if I look at my metadata, it's just there. So this is very confusing, for example. Also in Belgium, we use a lot the element PT free text because we have to deal with multilingualism a lot. We always have to, or often we have to say, uh, give names of addresses or other names in, in three or four languages. Um, so we, you, we try to use this PT free text for this, but in the old validator, this validated now in this new validator, it does not. So we have to figure out maybe what we do different or what is interpreted different. Also, apparently that dates are interpreted different, different in the old and the new validator. Um, and also, our coordinate reference system, which has been already a topic of a lot of discussion. We use a coordinate reference system that is not in the shortlist, that is in the technical guidelines. 
but in the old validator it was still okay apparently now in the new validator uh, it, it raises an error uh, so there are differences in the old and the new one and now we have to actually redo our work with the new validator because things that used to be okay apparently are not um, this is about the old validator so i will not discuss this now um, and this yeah maybe this is a better um, example of this multilingual multi <coughs> sorry lingualism that we have so for example the name of the national geographic institute we have it in english french dutch and german so we try to use this uh, pt free text um, but this is one of the examples is on, on, on how we have difficulty sometimes interpreting the data specs. We are not entirely sure how to do it. So we sometimes just implement and try to get rid basically of the red flags, make sure everything is green. But this is maybe not always the best way to do it. Um, well, um, Yes, and, and, and this is a small side note on the metadata editor that you can also find on the on the Inspire portal. And it's also something uh, Michael Lutz has mentioned is that maybe there should be, with all these tools you can find on the website, uh, a bit of disclaimers that they can be used or for what purpose they should be used. Because in this one we found that we try to use it but apparently it's quite out of date. We cannot use it anymore. But I can imagine that if data providers try to use this tool and create their metadata, for example, then the validator will, uh, the metadata will not pass the validator and then they don't know what's going wrong. So the, 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 the tools on the portal maybe are not very well integrated anymore. But um, this, this, now I raised a lot of, uh, issues let's say but in general i do want to say that i'm very happy with this validator um i started using it i think i don't remember exactly i guess a year ago when it was in beta testing and it did relieve me personally a lot of very of, of manual work manual testing writing schematron so it does a lot of work so okay there are still a few issues apparently that we have to figure out but it is a very useful tool. It is quite intuitive. Um, yeah, and I guess we are very happy that it's there. So that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, very much. Uh, and now um, i like to move further and uh, activate the screen for Paloma from uh, IGN Spain. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, Salius. Hello, people. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you, but uh, we don't see your screen yet. Please click uh, OK to the to the message. Yeah, now we see your screen. Yeah. I, okay. Eva, para ver esto. Hello, I'm Paloma Bat. I work in National Center of Geographic Information, and I'm responsible for money, Spanish monitoring to collect and analyze it of data set. The title of my presentation is the validation experience in, in, in Spain. This presentation is, a, a, is divided in four points. A short introduction, another part very technical about the interoperability, a second to last some geographic, tem a ge geographic thematic viewer, and the last some conclusions. Introductions. The special data infrastructure of Spain is fundamentally based on the eight national organization and 70 regional. The data set and service metadata are collected of Spain and official catalog of Spire data and service, called COTSI. All the metadata documents have been analyzed by the Spire monitoring. And now all metadata of data set and service are spy compliant. However, only approximately 21% of the special data set comply with the specification of SPIRE. 
45 out of every 219 Spanish special data set is conformity. 179 out of every 233 Spanish service is conformity. And 140 out of every 218 Spanish special data set is accessible through view and download service. But the spy monitoring process doesn't detect the lack of interoperability between special data set, metadata, view and alone service. And data set can have some special objects and these can be represented by vector geometrics and coverage functions. The special objects can download with all relevant key attributes and the relationships between special objects. There here are some questions. How are data set linked to the late view and download service? How is a view service linked to the data set metadata file? How can we know through the URL of a view service the description of the data set using the service metadata elements? How can we find the layers using the data set metadata? How can we download features using the data set metadata? In this immediate, five parts can be distinguished. Dataset metadata, view service, download service, metadata of web service, and web feature service. All these parts are fundamental and very linked by identify or codes. A dataset can have a spatial object with its georeference is rendered in a list on one layer of a view service and enable copies of complete, a special data save. Of or parts of such sheets. Finally, metadata documents must exist to describe view and alone service. Interoperability. Now there are two validator tools. In the, in the first tool validator, metadata validates metadata discovery and view and download service. And the second tool is called Inspire ETA validator and test another issues how Michael has told us before. The first tool is, is, is called Inspire your portal metadata validator and has to pass conform, conform, conformity metadata and interoperability. Conformity metadata is how complete a metadata document with respect to the spy metadata and how interoperability is a resource or group of resources are with respect to the spy implementation rules and the technical guidelines to document. If you have an uh, error about conformity, you have uh, one error. Error. The source metadata is complete, but if you don't pass interoperability, you have six uh, errors. I'm going to show two cases. The first case is when the webmaster service has an only layer. This layer renders an only feature types, and when feature service has an only feature type, for example, the administrative unit. If you want a, a develop service, you you have a 12 service, six webmaster service and six web feature service. One layer to one webmaster service and one feature type to only web feature service have some disadvantage. There are a lot of metadata documents of layers and feature types. These metadata files are identical except for a small difference between them. The publishment isn't true to the requirements of users. It isn't useful to them. They need to work with many network services. For instance, for the administrative unit, then you need 12 services, six web service and six web feature service. The second case is to obtain 100 interoperability is difficult when web service has a lot of all layers and web feature service has a lot of, of feature types. For example, a data set has six special object types. How many services do, you, do we develop? Two, one web service and one web feature service. Many layers to only web service and many feature types to only web feature service has some advantages. The organization manages the web service and web feature service 
in a better way. The metadata documents are related to data set and network service, but there are metadata documents for layers and spatial objects. The webmap service and web feature service give users a lot of usable information. But evaluation is more complex. You need a control of codes, name codes, and identifier. This is an example about administrative unit example. A data set has two spatial objects, administrative units and boundary times. We'll have one data set metadata file, one webmap service capa capabilities re response, and webmap service metadata file, one web feature service capabilities response, and web feature service metadata file. This is a slide, is a data set metadata. You can see three resources, a three identifiers. One, the first identifiers is to data set. The second identifiers is to administrative unit. And the, the third identifier is the administrative boundary. Only one metadata file to describe all resources because the most elements like authors, bonding boards, reference system, quality, and have the same value. This slide is the same. It's a data set metadata. And you need to include the URL webmap service and web feature service to link the data set with, this, uh, with, the, uh, with the service. And it is, this slide is the webmap service capabilities response. Each layer must have attribution, identifier, and metadata, and its metadata. The identifier is defined by the data provided. It what identifier? The local identifier is unique within the namespace, and is the same you define in code on data set metadata. If you have two layers, you need to define in the data set metadata you, uh, two, two identifiers. This is layer is the web feature service capabilities response. Is the elements extend capabilities, and you need define other spatial data set identifier. Is the code uh, code about data uh, data set. And this mm, and um, and you need define the copy results. You need link the meta the web service metadata document and web web feature service metadata document with the data set metadata. I have summary the the codes or interfaces you need to define the interoperability. And the portal the material viewer is a beta version. In this your portal, the user can access to all the information in the catalog visually. But if you have a low interoperability, your data set can display. If you uh, haven't well defined the codes or identifiers, the layers or feature types don't display in this your portal. In my organization, we have a lot of spatial objects about administrative unit, geography, transport network, geographic names, and so on. And we need a map or table where all codes or identifiers are defined. defined. For, example, for, uh, for, for example, and data set metadata, you need define all resources or codes identifiers you need. In webmap service get capabilities, you need the metadata URL, the identifiers of layers, uh, authority of layers, and so on. And for example, the web, master, the web feature service get capabilities, you need to define the data set, about, identify about data set. This is table is a real table uh, we works we work in in my organization. This example is about administrative unit. Conclusions. The regulation must be implement, implemented at a time. If you want 
to, to obtain 100% of interoperability. It's a very great benefit all components must be strongly linked, data set metadata, web mass service, and web feature service, get capabilities, and its metadata. We need a simple data set real with perfect, with web mass service, web feature service, and its metadata perfect. Um, it should facilitate work. And we work the other tools, the SPI ET validator is a new tool, and we think to include the, the interoperability. And thank you very much. <laughs> this is the final. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Paloma. Uh, <clears throat> I move shortly now to the last presentation from Denmark by Heide. Back yes, to Heide. <clears throat> Yes, good morning, everybody. Yes, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, my name is Heidi Van Parijt from the Danish Agency for Data Supply and Efficiency. Um, my agency, we have uh, two roles. We are the Inspire National Contact Points and we also have data sets. So we are also an Inspire data provider. Um, and I will ex uh, tell you about the experience we have with this new uh, Inspire validator here in Denmark. So uh, a small agenda for my presentation. Um, we have several drivers where we are using or where we started using the Inspire validator. I will tell you something about the actual experience. And I would like to conclude with some general conclusions about this Inspire validator. So the first driver for starting to use the Inspire data validator is that we have an internal key, a KPI, um, an internal key performance indicator that basically looks at this, uh, at the metadata, how well are we doing? Um, in order to, to easily measure on this, we created a small in-house application so we can generate an overview of how we are doing with uh, metadata, what is the compliance? We try to divide this per uh, metadata point of contact so we easily could see our own numbers, but also so we easily could see are there any agencies we should start to help with uh, improving their metadata. So before we've been doing uh, these calculations with the, uh, yeah, let's call it the old validator, the validator present at the geo portal. And we would like to check, can we do uh, the same kind of calculations with a new validator? A second driver to start using the Inspire Validator was that we um, decided to upgrade our uh, national geo portal. So we decided to upgrade our geo network installation. Here you see the old one, which was developed uh, in 2010. And we developed a new, um, we installed and, and developed a new uh, geo network installation. And of course, this was the chance to actually get some issues fixed. So we thought it was a good idea to, to use this validator and see, do we have any issues? Can we do something about it? And can we do the development within the project of uh, upgrading our national geo portal? A third driver is that uh, my agency started to offer a new service. Basically, we see if we can uh, act as a service provider for Danish Inspire um, providers. So basically, we would like to help other agencies to provide Inspire services on their data sets. Of course, when we start doing that, then there is an expectation from those data providers that the results of the tests in this Inspire validator are green. So this was a, a very strong driver um, to start using this validator. And to be more specific, we um, implemented a service on protected sites for the Danish Environmental Protection Agency and, and spend quite some time on using the validator for them. Then the fourth driver is, as already said before, it's this new application, uh, the thematic viewer, which has um, for the moment rather unfortunate statistics for Denmark. So this is also a very strong driver to try and investigate, okay, what's wrong? What can we do about it? Our experience, we've been using uh, many of the tests. As I said, we started mainly with metadata. We've also been testing um, data that have to follow the application schemas. We've been doing tests for web feature service and at the 
here the latest uh, weeks, we have also started to uh, look at the atom tests and see how uh, we can improve those. The people who have been doing this uh, are mainly, um, yeah, let's say, technical people, real implementers. Uh, Michael said also before, this is a target group. Um, and indeed, when you have the technical experience, it's okay, easy to, well, not easy, but, but it's okay to understand uh, the tests. Um, in, in the process of uh, testing with the Inspire Validator, we've encountered quite some issues. Some are questions, some are um, questions for clarification of certain things, maybe in the technical guidelines. Other issues were actually um, bugs in the tests. One main issue, let's call it actually a blocking issue, is that um, the way we build web feature services is that a user is required um, to give his login. And most of the tests, and that is valid for both the Inspire validator, but also the OGC validator, is that when you test, then all the extra parameters, they are cut off, they are taken away. Um, so that's that has been quite quite an issue for us. Um, we, we reported these issues and in the end we actually decided to open up our Inspire services so we could continue testing. It's maybe not a, a permanent decision but we were required to do so in order to continue the testing. Um, we also experienced other issues with uh, especially the web feature services is that they require a certain pattern to be followed for the for the the requests, and it actually challenged um, the way we usually build our services. So it's not just an error, but we have to, in some ways, rethink how we build our services and, and what the URLs to all the, the, the requests are. We, uh, as I said before, we upgraded our installation of GN Network, uh, and in that project, we also decided to integrate the Inspire validator into GeoNetwork. I mean, it's not a copy of it in GeoNetwork, but a feature has been added so that when you go in and you want to edit metadata, then you can actually call the Inspire validator from GeoNetwork itself. This is a, it's a feature that was actually developed in another project, but it was then integrated into our code base for GeoNetwork. And I have to say, I don't know what the status is right now, if this is something that is generally available in the latest version you can find on GitHub or not. But as I said, there's a, a button there when you can click Inspire Validation. Then you will have the overall results. Did it pass? Did it fail? And if it failed, then you get a link to the test report and then you can go in and check up on any errors, uh, on, on any errors and, and correct them. We decided to have our own installation, to have our own instance here. It's, it's not yet officially announced to all the Danish Inspire data providers, but we're working on it. Um, it's an installation that is supposed to be used only by users of the Danish uh, map supply. So you will need to have a login and password. Um, so, and that, that's also the reason why I didn't provide the link here, because as opposed to, for instance, the validator of ELS, it's uh, not supposed to be used by anybody. Our experience with the installation is that um, it's a rather straightforward installation and it was easy to get uh, good help from the people who actually developed uh, the framework. So some general conclusions. Um, we think definitely that the validator has proven its usefulness. It has helped us validating our Inspire implementation and it also raised some issues that in the end lead to that we have to clarify and correct the Inspire technical guidelines, which is worked on within the, the MIGT. We think that the setup with GitHub uh, works very well. It's very open. Um, everybody can go in and see ATS, ETS. It's easy to report an issue and there's follow up on the issues uh, from the from the MIGT group. So we think that the uh, setup works very well. We were involved in the ELF project. We had an earlier version of this validator and where we were also had to use the OGC validator. And I remember that at that time, we spent a lot of time in trying to understand how the validation was done and how to interpret it, the test results. So we have to say that the, the, 
the new validator is much easier to use. On the other hand, of course, the Inspire validator wouldn't be what it is today if that work hadn't been done uh, by OGC and by, by ELF. Another conclusion is that, okay, now we have this validator, but it's actually still hard to see the forest through the trees because what we really miss is a test that tests, okay, what are the most important things that have to be okay so that data sets can be found, they can be downloadable and they can be viewed. That is something we really miss um, and that would really help us in, um, in, in our work with, with having our um, data sets and services on the thematic viewer. And that's all actually also the conclusion that uh, Paloma from Spain made in the presentation before. And that actually concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi, a lot. Uh, and now we have a, a session uh, for, uh, for you posing questions uh, from the audience. So please, if anyone wants to pose an oral question, raise your hand. Otherwise, uh, you can uh, type a question in the chat window. <clears throat> I see one question which, uh, which was posed um, early by um, Bart Verbeck, uh, and the question was to Michael, actually. So the, the question was uh, um, on the... Um, is there any example of the WFS service served by geo server that could be validated 100% in the ETF validator. Uh, I don't know, uh, Michael, if you want, if you can comment on this. Yeah, I can, I cannot just say anything off the top of my head, uh, but we can, we can have a look uh, if, if we see anything. And the, the thing is that basically on the ETF validator, the, the test results are stored for only, I think, 10 days currently for resource limitation so basically we, we we will not store um we're not monitoring let's say what what tests are being executed but we can have a look to see um if we, if we can find anything and we can provide that as an example i think we've received a number of uh, suggestions already to to provide uh, let's say um per perfect examples for each of the test resources so that is one of the things that we could be could be looking into um in the future maybe i can i can make a comment on, on a number of the, the things that were being raised in the presentations. Uh, for me, this has been very, very, very useful. Um, I think uh, the, the feedback that you uh, all uh, four presenters have been, have been giving is, is basically really echoing the, um, the things that we're seeing and uh, discussing here in the team, but also discussing in the, in the MIG uh, T. Uh, is that we need to be more clear um, uh, about, uh, on one hand, how the different resources play together and how the different tools play together. So we're uh, actively developing the validator, but you've also seen we're actively de developing the, the new interface to the, to the geo portal, that is the semantic viewer, and all of these things uh, play together. And we see more and more member states are starting to implement things. So we, we're really, really seeing where things work and where things don't work. And I want to repeat that if you uh, find anything, if you have any questions about the results that you're seeing, you don't understand what you're seeing, please uh, let us know about them. Um, uh, to Anne, I would, say, I would say you provided a lot of issues, you did a lot of comparisons, that's very useful, but please uh, log issues in the relevant issue tracker so that we can really uh, look into uh, into the issues and don't assume that always the error will be at your end. Uh, in, in some cases uh, I, um, we will see that basically the the abstract test suites are not uh, perfect, uh, they're not consistent, um, maybe there's some errors in the ETS implementation, so pl please if you give us upload the examples that you've used to, to make the comparison we can really dig into the issues and we can we can try and make things work and, and more clear and, and, and more consistent. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say on the discrepancy between the abstract test suites um, for the data specifications, uh, that is indeed an issue that we have, uh, when we started development work, we basically rewrote the abstract test suites for the data specifications. So the reference for the implementation in the ETS is the ATS that is on GitHub. It's not 
that is based on but is not equivalent as you as you have spotted to the ones that are uh, listed in the annex of the data specification document so that is really something that we need to make sure to 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 be clear and be consistent about that and potentially we have to update the, the, the data spec documents to make sure that they point to the github ats and not to the ones that, that are currently in there thanks thank you michael very much it was very useful receiving your question your responses and comments <clears throat> i think if uh, anyone has more questions and uh, comments you are pleased to to communicate by email or through the inspire can uh, base camp uh, those that uh, like to be connected to the inspire can base camp please send me an email and i can connect you there uh, I see the, there is one uh, one question not necessarily related with the validation, but um, the question was to Heidi, will Denmark um, remove the passwords for requesting the services? Uh, uh, Heidi, could you comment this? Yes, so right now this, the services are open to anybody, so we don't need to log in and passwords. I think, but I'm not sure, we'll, once we figure out how to actually do work with login and passwords you will be required to do so again but then again i have to say they are still free it's a matter of signing up on our platform and getting a username and password you don't have to pay or anything it's free it's just we have a policy that we would like to know who our users are so that's why we are request a login and password usually okay thank you maybe another comment yes. to that uh, that i wanted to say I, we saw a few examples where i i had the feeling that you're you're you're, you're adjusting your implementations uh, so that it w it will work with the validator that is of course not really the the way that we would like it to do um again heidi you said that you already logged the issue to improve the validator uh, so, so that i think that is the the right way to do please don't change your implementation just so that you can use it in the validator um if there is anything that you think should be changed in the validator please let us know we'll look into it um and, and see um how we can fix it okay thank you very much michael I don't see any further question and I as well don't see any raised hand. So assume that uh, the presentations will have been uh, crystally clear or at least uh, no uh, prompt questions right now. <clears throat> so uh, as time is flying, I, I don't want to occupy your, your time. I thank uh, all of the presenters uh, and um, it was great uh, audience uh, to this webinar. As I said, the, the record and the presentation will become available through the Eurogeographics website. So, and by this, I, I uh, thank you a lot. Have a good day and like to close the webinar.